Yeah. There you go. We had a real good time. All the sand ants in the trader part right next to it. We got to. We got to. We did it all in about an hour and a half. wasn't 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 too bad. Weather wasn't too bad. I've got a subject this morning that I want to talk to you about. It's called "It Is Finished, But It's Not Over." The title is called "It Is Finished, But It's Not Over." Brother Shannon, I'm going to read John 10:17 through 18. I've got a I got a few passages of scripture, so if you'll just bear with me while I read these, I'll get into them. My lesson here in a minute. John 10:17 through 18 says, "Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father." John 4 and 34, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that have sent me and to finish his work. John 17, 2 through 4, And thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they may know, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth, and I have finished my work. John chapter 19, verses 28 and verse 30. And this was a prophecy of Psalm 69 and 21, this passage of Scripture was. It says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Verse 30 says, When Jesus... Therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now what I wanna what I want to look at this morning, Brother Rice, is the last three words that Jesus Christ spoke while he was on the cross. It is finished. Those were the last three words, Brother Ray, that he spoke. I want us to see exactly what it, he meant and to understand the importance that it has in our plan of salvation today because it's very important. One writer, and that was Leonard Ravenhill, a great preacher from years ago, years ago, said that these three words, it is finished, were the greatest words spoken by the greatest man who ever lived. They were the greatest words spoken by the greatest man who had ever lived. The scripture text I read lets us know that Jesus Christ gave his life willingly. There was nobody, Sister Leanne, that could take it from him. He did it of his own accord. He did it because he chose to do that. And that he alone had the power to take it up again. You know, he told the disciples, he said, you destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. He alone had the power to do that. And that he had finished or completed or accomplished all his work that he came to earth to do. When he spoke those three words, it is finished. He had completed his ministry that he had came to do on earth. He had accomplished everything that he had set out to do. I began to look at and I began to study these three words and I found that these three words that Jesus Christ spoke, it is finished, comes from one Greek word, tetaleste. And what what, what it actually means is a variety of different things, but it all points to one thing. In everyday life, the Greeks would use this word, testeleste. A servant would say to his master, testeleste, when a job had been completed, and his master would say, well done. The high priest would say, testeleste, after he would examine a sacrifice that was to be offered, meaning it's perfect or it's acceptable. I will accept that. After an artist had completed his work of art, he would step back and he would say, Testeleste, the masterpiece had been completed and it was excellent work. A merchant or a store owner would say, Testeleste, or stamp it on a loan document when a debt had been paid in full. Paid in full, that means a whole lot to us today. When he spoke those words on the cross, it is finished. Brother Billy, it meant that it was paid in full. That sin and the debt of sin had been paid in full, Brother Rice. 
The early century preacher Harry A. Ironside told the story of a young Russian soldier, and he was assigned the job of paymaster. It was his job to oversee all the paychecks and the payroll for all the soldiers in the army. And he gambled away all his pay, and he gambled away all the pay of the other soldiers. In learning an impending audit was on its way, the, soldiers, the soldier rec recorded his gambling losses in a ledger, and he recognized he could never repay the large debt that he had stolen and misappropriated. At the bottom of the page, he wrote a great debt. Who can pay it? So he decided, Brother Robbie, to take his own life. He pulled out his revolver and he placed it beside him. He was planning to take his life at midnight. But as the hour approached, the soldier grew sleepy and he fell asleep. That night, as Caesar Nicholas took his customary walk through the barracks, he noticed the light on in the soldier's barrack. And he slipped in and he read the note that this young man had scribbled at the bottom of the ledger. And he left. The soldier awoke, realizing the time was near for him to, to, to be discovered. He reached for his gun and he brought it to his head to pull the trigger to take his own life. When his glance fell on the ledger page, it said Nicholas on the bottom of the page. Because only Nicholas, the leader, could pay it in full. Because he had scribed his name on that, that meant that he was going to take care of that debt. He was going to help that young man out. And he was going to do away with all the debt and all the money that he had stolen. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, when he gave up the ghost, when he spoke those words, it is finished, he paid our sin debt for each and every one of us in the world today. Doesn't that excite you? He took my place. I didn't have to die. He took my place, Brother Rice. Oh, we're, we're all going to face death one of these days. It's inevitable unless the rapture of the church takes place. But I've got hope of a new life. I've got hope of a resurrection in Jesus Christ one of these days if I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name. Jesus Christ had lived for 33 years, and his ministry lasted three years. And when he had spoke these words, it is finished. It did not mean his life had ended or that it was over with or that it was completed, but that his work of being born and living his life free from sin and the task of selecting his disciples to spread this gospel had been completed. He came to earth to do what he wanted to do, to accomplish what he had done, to spread this message of this gospel. It is because of him that we have this message. Now, there's over 400 Old Testament prophecies that have been fulfilled from him being born of a virgin. You can read that in Matthew 18 through Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Isaiah 7 and 14, being born of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, his place of birth, his ministry in Galilee, being betrayed by a friend, sold for 30 pieces of silver, his hands and his feet pierced, not one of his bones broken, his resurrection and his ascension. All of these are prophecies that have been completed. They were finished. As the scripture had said, Jesus Christ had finished his work that he had come to earth to do. Now what we need to ask ourselves this morning is what does, that, what does that mean to me? How does that affect my life? That was a lot of years ago, Sister Judy. So how does it affect me today? How will, how will that Make a change in my life because he died on the cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and he rose again. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. How does that affect me today? How can that make a change in my life at where I am? Actually, when Jesus Christ spoke the words, Sister Maria, it's finished at the end of his life. It was just the beginning. I said it was just the beginning. All four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record that Jesus yielded up the ghost. The Spirit left his body. He died. He died. There was no life left in him. It was custom for them to come around, and if they weren't dead, to break the legs of the soldiers because crucifixion was an awful death. Often they would hang there and they would 
get to where they couldn't breathe. They would try to push themselves up, Brother Marcus, with their feet to where they could catch their breath, and they would come along, and they would break their legs. So they couldn't do that, and the death would happen more quickly. But when they came to him, the Bible says that he was dead, and he had already yielded up the ghost. He had died. Fulfilled the scripture that not a bone in his body would be broken. So first and foremost, we know that he died on the cross at Calvary. He took our place and he died for us. The song says that when he was on the cross, we were on his mind. It was a cruel death when you think about crucifixion. It was often for the most severe criminals, those that committed the, the most heinous crimes. And, and it was just a painful way of death. It was humiliation. They hung them up there just as naked as they could be. And let everybody come out and they made a mockery of them. And this man, Jesus Christ, that had never done anybody wrong. There was no sin in his life. They hung him on that cross at Calvary and he died in our place. Well, Petey suffered a humiliation. But he chose to do that. The scripture that I read said no man could take his life. And no man could take it up for him again. Only he and he alone could do that. Romans 5, 8 through 11, and it speaks about the atonement. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, the forgiveness of sin, the atonement for our sins when he died on the cross. The word reconciled in verse 10 means that we were brought back together with him through his death. His creation was brought back together with him. You know, it's, it, it, it's sad to say, but at the cross... We see the creator, the one that created the heavens and the earth, that spoke everything into existence, put to death by his own creation. You stop and think about how sad that, it, sad that is. That man that he had created, Adam, so that he could have a relationship with him. The creator, Brother Doyle, was put to death by his own creation. The crowd cried, crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas, a murderer and a thief. Swapped him out, and the Lord took his place to die on a cross at Calvary. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19 says, and this is speaking about the blood. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, one drop of his blood washed away all of man's sin. One drop of his blood washed away all of man's sin, Brother Billy. It washed it away. It, it redeemed us. It brought us back to him because he chose to die on that cross. He chose to shed his blood on the cross at Calvary. I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. Only one could do it. The one that was without sin. One that had no sin in him. And there was neither not guile found in his mouth. He knew not sin, but yet he took on all the sin of all mankind and he died on the cross. It's unbelievable. It's remarkable when you think about that. Ephesians 1 and 7 talks about us being redeemed. It talks about us being brought back. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. When we, when we kneel at an altar, and we can make an altar anywhere. It doesn't have to be up in front of the church. It can be at your house. It can be anywhere you want to make an altar at. And you ask God to forgive you of your sins. It's washed away. It's placed under the blood. Never to be remembered no more by him. The enemy will try to make you remember. He's an accuser of the brethren, the Bible tells us. 
But it's gone, Sister Leanne. It's washed away, never to be remembered no more. Repentance is something that we have to do over and over and over again. Why? Because we're still flesh. The Apostle Paul himself, the great man, the Apostle Paul says, I die daily. It means he found a place of repentance. Sometimes, as Brother G.L. said, just in case we had done anything that we shouldn't have or said anything that we shouldn't have, we find that place of repentance where we can go back over and over again and ask the Lord to forgive us if we've got anything in our life. I know this is kind of solemn this morning, but I felt like the Lord... I told Sister Stacy I was working on something else the other day, and we went on visitation and, and everything, and I came back over to the church and just kind of began to pray. And, and uh, what I had just didn't feel right. It just There was something about it. It would, probably would have been good enough, but it just wasn't right, Sister Judy. And uh, I got a box of my notebooks. I've, I, I've had the privilege of, of teaching since I was about 21 years old. I started teaching the young, young adult class, or the young boys class, when I was 21, I'm 50 now, I don't care to tell you my age. <laughs> I've got a lot of notebooks where I've taught a lot of lessons. We've got a lot of them on flash drive now to where we recorded them over and tried to do that to preserve them. And I, I had a box of notebooks with me. They're still out in the car with some of my other books. And I just sit down and just begin to pray and just kind of begin to go through them. And I come across this lesson that I taught. Man, it's probably been... 10, 12, 13 years ago, and, and it just felt right. It felt like somebody needed to hear today that it's not over. That it's not over. We still have another opportunity this morning. We still have another opportunity today to get right with God. No matter what's going on in our life, no matter what we're facing, what we're going through, it's not over. We still are under the mercy and grace of God today. That excites me. God's grace, that unmerited favor of God that none of us deserve, and that mercy that holds back what we actually should get. Oh, that, that excites me. I'm telling you, that excites me to know that God's still reaching for somebody this morning. Somebody needs to hear this this morning and receive it. Even for us that have been in church for years and years and years, never, never forget that he went to that cross and he died for me. He died for you. He gave his life for us. We never need to forget that. It's overwhelming when we attempt to contemplate God and his redemptive plan for mankind. The gulf that exists between a holy God and a fallen man are hard to understand. That, that, that a God that knew not sin would take our place at Calvary. It's hard for us to contemplate that. It's hard for us to understand that. Why would God bother to redeem sinful man back unto himself? Man had broken his creator's law and disobeyed him in eating the forbidden fruit in the garden. It was a direct act of disobedience. And by that death was introduced, by that sin became a factor in Adam's life and all of creation from then, from then on. Adam himself even recognized its impact more in his own family, when his own son, Cain, rose up and slew his other son, Abel. He recognized what sin had brought forth. God placed him in a utopia, in the Garden of Eden. And he told him, he said, you can have anything you want here. Anything that you want here. Everything is available to you except one thing. You cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know the story. I've, I've told it before. Brother Jill's preached about it. We've heard it time and time and time again. And I see Eve standing there in front of that tree that had this whole garden. The mist come up out of the ground and watered it. It was just a beautiful place, if you can imagine, in your mind. And yet she's standing in front of the one thing that she couldn't have a hold of. That she couldn't partake of, Brother Marcus. All the beauty that was there, and she's sitting here staring at this tree. We know the serpent come along. The Bible says that he beguiled her, he tricked her. He told her, you're not going to become as, as God. He, it's not going to happen. And she ate of the fruit and because of the disobedience. And, and I've said that she took the fruit, she gave it to Adam. He knew where that fruit came from. There was no doubt in his mind what had happened. 
what had taken place. And because of that, he paid for the consequences of his actions. He paid for the consequences of his sin. Death and sickness, suffering, physical corruption, all became fruits of sin. No man from Adam to the present is able to act as the redeemer of fallen man. Nobody could take that place but Jesus Christ. For each of us, to sh for each of us shares the fallen nature of Adam. We were all born into sin and shaped into iniquity. It's just the way it was. It's just the way that it is. Any baby being born from here on out will face the same consequences. That's the way it is. All have sinned. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That does not leave anybody exempt. That includes everybody. And all the victims of Adam's disobedience need redemption today. A person asked to pay the price for the demands of sin was not to be found outside of Jesus Christ. It would take a sinless one, a sacrifice that was without spot or the stains of sin. It would have to be one that could live free from giving in to temptation of sin. It would have to take one who could face the devil and destroy him by enduring the test of sin and not yielding to it. Jesus Christ was the answer to the demands of sin. I said Jesus Christ was the answer to the demands of sin. He took our place. He took our place. Hebrews 4 and 15 tells us, says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. You and I will never face anything in life or come up against anything in life that we cannot overcome with Jesus Christ on our side. Because he faced it. You've got to remember that he was a man, that there was a human side to him. There was a human nature to, the, to him. Even though he was God manifested in the flesh, there was a human nature to him. He got hungry, he had to eat. He got sleepy, he had to go to sleep, Brother Marcus. He got tired. But the Bible says he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. We can't do it on our own. But with him on our side, we can do that. When we have the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside of us, we can overcome anything. Anything that we face, if we allow to the Lord to lead us and guide us and direct us. For him to be on our side. Sinful man now has a sinless redeemer who faced every temptation the devil had to offer without yielding. Matthew chapter 4, I believe it is, you read where he has fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And old Slewfoot, old devil come around and began to tempt him with different things. And he defeated him, Brother Billy, by the word. He defeated him by the word of God. Everything that the devil offered to him, he came back with what the word of God said to oppose it. He defeated him through the word of God. So it's important that we know this Bible. It's important that we know what the word says and we have it on the inside of us. He was not simply a mortal man, but he was both God and man. He was the offspring of David, and he was Jesus Christ, the mighty God. He was born as a baby to become a sinless sacrifice, the Lamb of God without spot or blemish to be offered at Calvary for the sins of the entire world. The one who created the world was also the one who died for that world as a man, as a sinless man. He wasn't a God when he hung up on that cross. He was God, but he didn't die as a God. He died as a man, Sister Judy. He took our place on that cross at Calvary. Man must have a redeemer or die not only a natural death, but even worse, a spiritual death. Sin separated man from his creator God, and man alone could not find his way back to God from total spiritual darkness that sin had caused. Sin divided us. Sin separated us. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the Lord kicked them out. She was going to have to suffer childbirth. 
He was going to have to work the fields by the sweat of his brow. There was consequences for their sin, and the Lord kicked them out. And they had to make it on their own. A Redeemer was the only hope for man. A Redeemer that was not marred by sin to overcome by, or overcome by temptations of the flesh. God would redeem man and he would do it by coming himself and living a sinless life in a sin-cursed world. This world that we live in today is a sinful world. It's just unbelievable the things that take place. How many of you have Facebook? I figured every hand in here would go up. I read something on there the other day. This lady, her, her child was crying. And she was so frustrated with it, Allison, that she cut its throat. I mean, what's coming to people? What's, what's happening? What's going on in the world with the things that we're seeing and the things that's taking place? I'll tell you what it is. It's a, sin, it's a curse of sin. Nothing but sin in people's life that caused somebody to do that. The devil has got such a hold on people anymore that, it, that it's crazy, that it's just, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. We live in a sin-cursed world. This he did by overcoming the weaknesses of Adam, defeating sin and overcoming death by his own resurrection. God manifested himself in the flesh of Jesus Christ to redeem man back to himself. He took our place, as I cannot say that enough. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. He came to earth to live as a man. He preached to the Gentiles. He preached to the Jews who rejected him. I find it very interesting within the scripture that when blood is mentioned in connection with an Old Testament sacrifice, if they committed a sin, often an animal would be used as a sacrifice, Brother Rice, to take the place of their sin. And a lot of times when that happened, there was no name mentioned of the victim. There was no name mentioned of what animal it was. But when blood is mentioned in the New Testament, it is mentioned with the name of the one who shed it. And more than likely, it was Jesus Christ, our Savior, who shed his blood. Because the person who sheds the blood gives the value to its work. Because he was without sin. It gives value to his work. Not only did Jesus Christ die, he was buried in a borrowed tomb that was guarded. A lot of people want to say that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was a hoax. That it never actually happened, that it never actually took place. But I can tell you in reading and studying this, not only did Jesus Christ die, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. Nothing that he ever had did he own. He didn't have a place of his own where he could lay down his head. Because you know what? He, was going, he wasn't going to be here permanently. He was just passing through. He was buried in a borrowed tomb that was guarded by 16 Roman soldiers who faced death by crucifixion if they were found sleeping on, the duty, on duty or if they left their post, Sister Maria. A two-ton stone placed in front of the tomb, and it was sealed with Pilate's ring. They would often put string from one side to the other, and they would put a piece of clay or putty in it, and it was sealed with the ring of whoever was in charge of the king at that time. So it was sealed with Pilate's ring. He was in charge at that time. Anyone breaking the seal would face death by being crucified upside down. But I read in Matthew chapter 28 where Mary Magdalene and Mary came to the tomb and the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. An angel tells him, he said, fear not, I know you see Jesus which was crucified, but he's not here. For he is risen as he said, and come see the place where he did lay. And they went into the tomb and he wasn't there. He, was already, he had already 